I'd like today to introduce our speaker, Kathy Clemens. As a master gardener since 2021, she has been focused on sustainable landscaping and use of native plants. She was a co-presenter with Elaine Mills on Keystone Native Plants. Her interest in deer grew from the frequent visits of the local herd to her neighborhood. Kathy's encounters with these hungry animals and the nursery and daycare for fawns next to her in her next door neighbor's yard prompted her to research deer and learn what to do to discourage them from visiting her garden. And we're delighted to welcome her for this very, very interesting topic today. Kathy, welcome. Thank you and welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us to hear about strategies to cope with deer. Deer are majestic animals and very smart creatures. I agree with Dr. Blossy of Cornell that we need to treat them with respect and have a responsibility to be better stewards of our wildlife. Now, do deer consider your garden to be an all you can eat buffet? It is so disheartening to discover that plantings that you've spent money, time and energy in adding to your garden have been mangled by these wonderful animals. Deer are clever and often not fooled by our attempts to prevent their munching. And my guess is that you may have had some unhappy experiences with deer. Well, today you're gonna to learn that there is more to coping with deer than just using deer resistant plants. You need a toolbox of strategies to help. Today, I'm going to share information and strategies gleaned from university research and practical experience to help you develop ways to outsmart those hungry deer. First, we'll talk about why we have so many deer and what authorities are doing about it. Next, we'll delve into deer biology and behavior to help you make smart and varied gardening decisions. I will show you the telltale signs of deer in your garden, and then we'll explore ways to keep them away and protect your plants, including repellent, scaring devices, and physical barriers. You'll learn landscaping tips, including creative hardscaping, plant choice, and arrangement. We'll talk about native and non-native plants that usually are less palatable to our four-legged diners. And finally, I will share some helpful resources for coexisting with deer and offering a positive approach for gardening in deer country. Have you noticed more deer roaming through your neighborhood? Well, you're not alone. Actually, this is a problem across the country. Let me give you a little bit of history. When Jamestown was settled in 1607, there were approximately 500,000 deer in Virginia. Over hunting of deer in the early 1900s greatly reduced the herds to the point that they were almost extinct. By the time the movie Bambi was released in 1942, there were only 500,000 deer in the United States. Well, Virginia joined other states in reestablishing deer herds for hunting from 1940 to 1980 with really great success. Today, there are 36 million deer in the United States and almost a million in Virginia. Why did this happen? Well, land use changed from agricultural spaces to suburban and urban areas creating an ideal habitat. Deer like to feed on the safe open edges of wooded areas and home gardens attract them with the abundant food options they offer. Nearby forests and parklands provide cover. Lack of natural predators and human predators allow herds to grow. We do not have gray wolves and Eastern cougars hunting in this area any longer. And deer hunting is not allowed in Arlington for sure. And there is no deer management in place in Arlington County. Without predators, a herd can double in one year. Attitudes have changed concerning human involvement with nature. According to environmental historian Ralph Lutz, the Disney classic Bambi promoted the idea that human intervention was harmful to nature and as a result restricted hunting in the establishment of deer protected areas allowed abundant herd growth. Attitudes changed concerning human involvement, as I told you, and deer reproduce very quickly. Five female deer and five male deer can produce up to 200 deer in just five years. 
and currently there just are more deer than our natural environments can handle. Plus, deer are very adaptable animals, adjusting to new habitats, diet options. We regularly see that in our gardens. All of these factors allow the deer to reproduce at an equal or higher rate than our, we can manage. Now, this is a, a picture of Lacey Woods Park in Arlington, which is a healthy woodland area. It has diverse layers, a variety of trees and plants, and provides food and shelter for wildlife. Now you're viewing a picture of Long Branch Park taken the very same day. This park is experiencing heavy deer pressure. When there are too many deer in the forest, the ecosystem is harmed. Deer are hardy eaters of acorns, leaves, twigs, flowers, shrubs, and young trees each day, consuming five to seven pounds. Anything under six feet is vulnerable. Only limited tree species are able to survive. Young oaks are not able to replace the existing oaks when they die. Non-native and invasive plants take over. Birds and animals lose their habitat and insects and pollinators lose hosts and food sources. The Chesapeake watershed receives excessive runoff because there are fewer plants to absorb the rain. Heavy deer pressure destroys the forest. Deer also have an impact on people and on deer. Large numbers of deer make it easier for disease to spread. While chronic wasting disease is not yet in Arlington County, it has been identified in Fairfax County this year. Human health is impacted by tick-borne illnesses. A recent uh, study from the University of Maryland indicates that there are more deer spending more time in residential yards than was previously thought. Deer serve as a keystone host for black-legged tick and the lone star tick. As deer presence increases, the number of ticks increase. And what happens is the ticks hitch a ride on the deer to lawn edges where the tick larva hatch during the spring and summer. So the bottom line here is that you don't have to just check yourself for ticks if you've been walking in the woods. You have to be aware that the deer have brought them to you in your own backyards. There is also concern about deer vehicle collisions. They are, particularly during rutting season, they are so busy searching for a mate, they're not looking for cars or bicycles. So where are they going to go? They're going to eat in our gardens. Now, what is being done in Arlington? Uh, we do not have a deer management program like the ones that are nearby to us that are safe and active. Arlington is exploring the need for such a program. After conducting an aerial survey of the deer population, the evaluators found that there are just too many deer in Arlington park lines and recommended aggressive deer management. A new study is underway to develop a plan of action that the county board will consider in the future. So you need to get to know your dinner guest. By understanding deer biology, behavior, feeding habits, and likes and dislikes, you can select effective strategies to make your garden less attractive to these ravenous animals. Let me give you a few basic stats on deer. Deer live eight to 12 years if they're good food resources. Bucks stand 36 to 40 inches at the shoulder and weigh about 125 to 200 pounds. Does are 30 to 34 inches at the shoulder and weigh 80 to 160 pounds. They are eating machines requiring six to eight pounds of food per 100 pounds of body mass daily. They often stand on their hind legs to eat food. A seven month old can reach five feet. A, an adult doe can reach six feet and the bucks can reach seven feet. They blend in with their surroundings. During the spring and summer, they sport a reddish brown coat, which turns gray brown in the fall and winter. These agile animals can run 35 miles an hour to find safety if they need to, and make leaps as high as nine feet from a standing position if needed. They can do a jump 
20 to 30 feet from a, a run. I mean, they can crawl through gaps as small as seven and a half inches. Deer populations grow very rapidly. They start breeding when they're one year old and continue for eight to 10 years. Deer breed mid-September through February with November the peak time of rut. Does produce one to three fawns in the spring. Newborns are about the size of a human hand. A doe will leave her young in a protected area for several hours to feed before returning to nurse and clean the fawn. During the first two to three years of life, you'll notice that fawn being cared for that way. If you see a fawn by itself, please leave it alone. The mother will return. Fawns stay with the doe for the first year. They learn which plants are good to eat and where to find them. They will return to those plants the following year. Keep that in mind. Yearling does stay and form a family unit. They travel in matriarchal groups with the dominant doe leading her young. Male deer leave after the first year. Ah, the rack, the crowning glory of the male deer. Male deer grow a new set of antlers each year from April to August. The antlers are covered with velvet. It's a, a layer of soft, hairy skin that nourishes the antlers that can grow a half an inch a day during the summer. In the late summer, the velvet becomes itchy and the deer often rub it off on woody branches and the trunks of trees as they polish their antlers, damaging those plants. They use the antlers to fight over the right to mate during breeding season and they are shed in the winter. Deer senses allow them to always be on guard. Their strong sense of smell helps them detect odors from a considerable distance. This enables them to know if predators are nearby, to find yummy plants, to bond with other deer and to communicate. They have scent producing glands between their toes that allow them to leave a scent when they're walking along paths, mark their territories and communicate with other deer. They have superb hearing. They can move each funnel shaped ear separately to hear sounds that are nearby and they can pick up a faint sound and determine how far away it is. Even when they are sleeping, their ears move as they listen and decide if the sound is a familiar one and they're safe or if the brain registers the sound as a predator and they awaken and know they have to take action. Deer have eyes on both sides of their head that allow them to see from all angles and a 310 degree field of vision. They can see slight movements from a distance. They're able to see nine times more light because their pupils have a slit across them, which allows them this great night vision that we as people don't have. They can't see red or orange, but they have good color distinction of blues and yellows, but they do have poor depth perception. Now, it's good to know about their habits. They are an edge creature that usually feed just outside of woodlands. They tend to live near mixed conifer hardwood forests, shrublands, and old fields. Deer want safe areas close by when they're feeding. Their home range is just about a mile. They establish daily and nightly trails that are chosen for easy walking and good visibility all around. They learn from one another. They rely on danger signals, the flick of their white tails, as well as the scent of trails and the feeding experiences of others. They learn which plants are nutritious and those that are toxic and should be avoided. Deer adapt well to nearly all human modified environments. They quickly learn to become used to strange sights, sounds, and smells. They learn that that white cloth they see flipping on the tree branch isn't a warning from another deer and that they can go ahead and browse there. They are very efficient and clever animals and don't like to exert themselves more than necessary. They would rather go under, around, or through a fence than jump it. They're cautious. They don't like to jump into tight quarters because they need to be able to make a quick escape. 
they won't jump into places they can't see because they don't know if a predator might be lurking on the other side and they need sturdy footing. Now, deer usually come out to feed from dusk until dawn, but they will eat anytime they're hungry. Deer are browsers. They will routinely stop at one plant for a few minutes, nibbling the tops and sides before moving on to another plant. Usually they feed for an hour or so, filling their first stomach before finding a safe place, often a wooded area, to ruminate and chew their cud. A few years ago, they could often be found resting under my neighbor's trampoline. They're seasonal eaters. Certain foods are preferred and nutritionally important during different times of the year. Herd tastes vary by region. The food preferences of one group may be very different from others. Your neighbor's Akuba might have only leaves six feet above the ground, but the deer who frequent your yard might ignore your shrub. And they're curious. They'll try new plants. Anytime you put a new plant in, if your garden's like mine, you'll find that they know which one it is and they'll see if it's good. They have superb food memories and will return each year to where they found them the year prior. Deer are seasonal animals. They have very predictable behaviors that can inform our gardening practices. In the spring, deer are ravenous, targeting new growth on plants and trees. These juicy and tender plants are high in protein and other nutrients they need. Many plants that are tasty in the spring will become less palatable later in the year. Bucks tend to seek out proteins, particularly nitrogen-fixing plants such as peas. And in spring, those cute little fawns are born. Does focus on raising their young. The fawns learn from their mothers what is good to eat. And through tasting trials, young deer learn which plants to eat and how they change in their appearance, taste, nutritional value, and toxic effect. The next year, they will recall which plants to eat and where to find them. You do not want to encourage fawns to visit your garden or you are likely to develop a very long-term feeding relationship. Summer is a time when deer focus on gaining weight. They love home gardens with their lush, well-watered and fertilized plantings. During the summer, many plants change, making them less attractive to deer. Some develop prickles, barbs, or hairy leaves. The chemistry of the plants may change, affecting scent, taste, nutritional value, and toxicity. We'll do a deeper dive into these plants later. During the fall, deer really focus on gaining weight. They eat a wider range of plants as summer garden plants start to disappear. Deer seek these foods in wooded areas as well as our gardens. They particularly like to eat mast. That's hard seed nuts that make up about 50% of their diet. They look for beech nuts, wild cherry seeds, and white oak acorns, a particular favorite, to build fat reserves for the winter. This is also the time when bucks mark their territories during rutting season and rub their antlers, causing damage to shrubs and trees. Now, winter is really hard on deer. Food can be scarce, particularly if there's been an extreme cold or snow cover. And during this season, deer will eat foods they normally bypass. Broadleaf evergreens and conifers ignored during other parts of the year are often browsed. Any vegetation can be a meal, including leaves, sedges, bark, woody plants, mushrooms, dormant bulbs. They will even eat poison ivy. Deer will push through fencing or other barriers, either going over or under if they are starving. How do you know if deer are munching in your yard? Here are a few telltale signs that deer have been in your garden and not a rabbit or an errant weed whacker. Deer don't have upper incisors. They press their lower incisors against the rough pad on the top of their mouths when grabbing leaves or stems off plants, leaving a ragged edge. Rabbits tend to leave a clean 45 degree cut and deer often also don't leave any tooth marks. 
Deer damage may first appear as thinning on lower branches. Buds, twig ends, and leaves are savored by these diners. Branches less than one inch are tasty for browsing. They like to stop at one plant for a few minutes, sampling the tops and sides before moving on to another plant. Plants shorter than three inches are often prime targets. You might find some small plants uprooted. Before I go on, I should say that you're often will trample plants as they go around. You may also notice in your garden some places in the mulch where there's a round space, an indentation, or you might see some plants, an oblong space that seems to be bent down. And that's where they may have been taking a nap in your yard. Now, trees have damaged trunks or branches when bucks rub their antlers against them to remove the antler velvet in late summer and early fall. The trees may have vertical scrapes and shredded areas where the bare wood is exposed. This is particularly damaging for the tree as it disturbs the cambium layer, which can lead to the death of young trees. Anything growing from ground level to six feet is on the menu. You can see a browse line on plants they continually eat. They may not kill the plant, but the deer can ruin the shape of a tree or shrub. Deer scat looks like black jelly beans with pinched off ends and usually appears in large clusters. Rabbit scat is more rounded and usually has only six to eight pellets. Deer tracks appear as upside down hearts, two-toed or cloven imprints. You might discover deer trails going through parts of your yard. Deer tend to use the same paths each day, preferring easy walking, good visibility, and trails that allow them to conserve energy. If you find evidence that deer are visiting your yard, it's time to get into action. What should you do? You can scare them, but does it work? Deer are often skittish when in first encountering new or surprising experiences, but they're very smart and can quickly determine if there's no danger associated with them. Scaring devices seem to work best when there's low deer pressure and they are used for a short time. And it's important to move them around, incorporating movement in the device and using repellents in combination with them. That can improve their effectiveness. A wide variety of auto devices are available in the market to scare, scare deer. Whistles, loud noises, or radios playing talk stations all night really might not be warmly welcomed by your neighbors. Plus, after a few nights, the deer would get used to them and aren't disturbed while they browse on your yummy plants. Now, visual devices such as pie plates or streamers hanging from trees or motion-activated lights might work briefly. The deer get used to them since there's no negative impact. However, I have heard of a homeowner who used a motion detector to turn on a bright light and a fan that inflated a snowman family. While the deer were frightened away, it turned out to be a raccoon crowd pleaser. Moving the blow up to different locations in the yard helped keep the deer at bay. Dogs can also be a possible source of being able to keep the deer away. A barking dog can make it very uncomfortable for them to be there. But after a while, if the dog is tethered, they'll know that they can munch just beyond his leash. Studies have shown they're most effective with uh, an invisible fence allowing them to chase the freeloaders from the buffet, but it's also better too if they're able to stay out overnight. Now, you have to be aware that in some situations, Deer may become aggressive, particularly if a doe is with her fawn and stand their ground or even charge the dog. Now, I know of folks who didn't have visits from deer when they had dogs, although the dogs were not on patrol. But after the dog died, they started having frequent deer visits. Motion activated sprinklers may be your best bet to shoo deer away. When it detects motion, the sprinkler sends out a sharp spray of water. It can be adjusted to target areas in your yard or individual plants. You may find that one sprinkler protects a small to medium yard and you might need a larger one or rather more than one for a larger area. It's useful to move the sprinkler around your yard every few days for best protection as it changes things up for the deer. 
folks who use them feel that it's good to have an infrared sensor so they can work during the night as well as the day. And taller models seem to be more effective than shorter ones since they more readily recognize deer and don't turn on when the wind blows growing plants. Some folks say that the battery powered units send a stronger spray of water than the solar powered ones. And they do work very well during the growing season, but they aren't quite as effective when the hoses freeze. My neighbor says that his sprayer allowed him to grow vegetables in his yard for the first time. Repellents can also be an effective way to discourage deer browsing. No products provide absolute protection, but they will reduce damage. Some are sprayed onto plant leaves and twigs, and others are granular and spread on the ground near plants and around borders. Deer use smell and taste to help them find food. Repellents work by providing a bad taste, a repulsive or frightening odor, or both to make plants unattractive so that the deer will go elsewhere. Taste repellents require that the deer taste the plant and repelling them. They would be containing things such as hot peppers, blood or egg. They are limiting because the deer must eat the plant to know that it tastes awful and that many other deer may have to do the same taste test, causing more damage to your garden. Order repellents take advantage of the deer's keen sense of smell and may contain blood, garlic oil, putrid eggs, solids, or predator urine. They can be sprayed on plants or placed on the ground near plants or around the garden perimeter. There are also some products that incorporate both taste and odor, and these are the ones that many experts feel work best. They say that products that contain egg also seem to be very effective. Whatever you use, try to use the right product for your plant. Many are safe for ornamentals, but not safe for edibles. So please carefully read the directions to make sure it's appropriate for the plant you wanna use. Check to see how often you need to use it and if there's any protective gear you need. Repellents work best in areas of low to moderate pressure when alternate food sources are available and consider them in smaller areas of your garden and on plants you value that are high on the deer favorite list. Spray all new plantings with an odor-based or odor-taste combo. Deer are curious and will check out any new plant, even those that are supposed to be on the deer resistant list. If their first encounter is unpleasant, they're likely to avoid that plant when they're actively looking for food. Now, the timing of using repellents is so, so important. Think about seasonal deer feeding habits. Apply repellents before the expected periods of browsing. Remember, you wanna make your plants undesirable to deer so they will want to go elsewhere to eat. Because deer are creatures of habit, once they establish a feeding pattern, it is an uphill battle to keep them out of your garden after that. Also, it is particularly important to make sure any nearby fawns don't find your garden enticing. They will continue to visit year after year as they grow with much bigger appetites. In the spring, start applications with two weeks of bud break then apply to new growth every three to four weeks or whatever that repellent suggests. Deer are hungry animals that love that moist, tender spring growth. For winter protection, mid-fall and early winter application is good. Be diligent about reapplying. Products range from every few weeks to months. Don't forget to apply the deterrent because the buck here is not gonna forget your plants. New growth needs to be protected. So be aware that rain or cold weather can also cause taste and scent properties to decline. If using a taste-based formula, apply sprays from six feet down to the base of the plant as deer typically browse from top to bottom. And it is best to rotate products to surprise the deer so they don't get used to them and try to use a different repellent from your neighbor. The buck will be waiting and watching. These are a few of popular deer repellents that are out on the market. 
there is additional information in your packet about studies that have been done about deer repellents. Many of us like to use DIY things in our garden, and I thought I'd try a few on you. One university suggested spraying a cotton rope with repellent and hanging it at 36 inches around a garden bed you want to protect or even around the perimeter of your property. Now, the University of Minnesota found a homemade solution that they think is very effective during summer months when conscientiously applied. It is made in a blender first with three raw eggs and a cup of water. And then you take that mix out and add water to create a gallon and strain it. Then you spray it on new growth until leaves are wet and shiny. Uh, you are reapplied every two weeks or after rain. They advise that adding any other ingredients would make it less effective. And their study found that it would cover 75% of a gardener's needs at minimum cost. You might want to consider this if you want to be frugal or you've run out of your commercial product. Highly scented soap has been found effective in some situations. A hole is drilled into the soap and it can be hung from trees, shrubs, or plantings protecting a three-foot radius. You might find that you need several hanging bars in your garden. I carefully hung so soap in mesh bags in my garden in areas I wanted to protect. Within two days, four of the bags were empty and three were missing. Now, we don't know exactly what happened to them, but our guess is that there were raccoons having some highly scented water play. You need to be aware of deer throughout the year. You should be persistent and spray routinely. Notice the weather. Remember, cold weather may limit effectiveness. In winter, deer may be so hungry that they will tolerate the nasty odor and bitter taste to fill their empty stomachs. Use odor and or scare deterrents on the boundaries of your property to prevent deer from coming in. If you notice deer paths on your property, spray or sprinkle deterrents on the paths to redirect them off of your yard. And remember, you're likely to have better luck if you combine deterrents. We're going to move on to barriers. There are several kinds of barriers that you can use to protect young trees and other woodies from serious seasonal damage caused by deer browsing and buck rubs. From August to December, bucks rub their antlers against shrubs, small saplings, tree branches, and trunks to remove that itchy velvet and polish them. This damages the bark and creates lasting scars and structural weakness. Tree tubes or guards protect tender bark from antler rubs. They can be made of polypropylene or corrugated plastic, and they're placed around the seedling's trunk when it's planted. Protection is needed until the trunk is about four inches in diameter. Wire cages can be made of metal fencing or heavy mesh to provide protection to smaller, younger plants that are much more susceptible to significant damage from deer feeding. When used with young shrubs or trees, they should be one and a half feet in diameter and three to four feet tall. And if you're protecting trees, experts suggest they be six feet tall. They are good being used with single plants or groupings. But the main thing to remember is that the cage needs to be tall enough and wide enough to prevent a deer from being able to lean over and take a bite. Plastic netting can protect single plants or groupings. Netting typically works best in areas with light deer feeding. Lightweight polyurethane mesh can be purchased in rolls or packages and used to erect temporary fences around beds, small areas, or containers. Care must be taken to ensure that animals will not become entangled in the mesh. Now, fences are probably the most effective way to keep deer out. They need to be tall enough so that they can't be jumped over, strong enough to withstand deer pushing into the fence and put in the right place to keep the deer out. Fencing deer out is the only true option for protecting vegetables and fruit. 
Now, when thinking about fencing, it helps to consider what we know about deer behavior. Deer are confident jumpers of high fences when they have a view of the landing area. They don't like to jump into areas they can't see. They can jump a 10 foot fence, but prefer not to. They would rather go under or through a fence than jump it. They don't like to assert themselves any more than necessary. Poor depth perception makes them less confident in judging horizontal jumping distances. They can crawl under barriers that allow a seven and a half inch clearance, and they are persistent and will push into weak areas. Let's look at traditional fences for a moment. And first, the one on your left, which is a tall woven fence. Those that are at least eight feet tall are the most effective type. And this fencing is useful in areas of high or moderate deer pressure. These fences require little maintenance and their flexibility helps keep deer from being injured if they run into them, but they're expensive and they may make your yard look like a fortress. Tall polypropylene fences effectively keep deer out at a seven foot height where deer pressure is light to moderate. They work well for home vegetable gardens, landscaping, and individual plants. They are less expensive, easier to install and repair, and less visually obtrusive than wire fences. They do need to be flagged with cloth strips to alert deer so they won't bound into them. And as with other forms of fencing, they must be properly anchored to the ground to keep deer from shimmying under. Another option are wood fences, and they don't only have to be five to six feet tall. Deer won't jump them because their view is obscured. They won't know what's growing in there. And they also won't want to jump in there because they don't know if their predator is present. They can be pricey, but my guess is in this yard, they've been pretty effective because the blossoms of those daylilies are still intact. Electric fences are another option. They keep deer out and can be shorter than eight feet. They provide a psychological boundary by shocking the deer so that they will avoid the fence. They will keep away and they work best during the summer and fall when the other food sources are available to deer. There are a variety of different types out there, including some portable models. They are a good choice for low to moderate deer pressure, in particular the peanut butter fence. And the way this one works is that there are two lines of wire or poly tape that are strung, and there's strips of aluminum foil with dabs of peanut butter that are attached to the upper line. The colorful wire and the peanut butter track the deer over to the fence, and when the deer's nose touches it, they get a shock and that conditions them to stay away. Well, electric fences do require maintenance and can easily lose power because of contact with vegetation. It may be an issue for your pets or the neighborhood kids. This has been an option that folks have used with good luck. If you think you wanna do it, you must check with your zoning laws to make sure they'll be available. There's some other kinds of fencing options to consider. Let's explore double perimeter fences. These fences are two four foot fences that are four to five feet apart. Another type is when you hang a cotton rope dipped in odor based repellent on post 26 inches high around an area you wanna protect. You make an outer fence five feet away from that first fence with 30 pound fishing line hung at 12, 24 and 36 inches on posts. One line hung at 26 inches, that's actually worked in trials. What happens is as the deer approach the fence, they can't see that monofilament and they become edgy and cautious when they come in contact with it. Another thing to consider is to take fishing line or that rope that's been dipped in deterrent and team it with another existing fence, a split rail fence, a picket fence, or a stone wall, placing it four to five feet away from it. 
A very creative double fence was developed by a master gardener, master naturalist, after observing two bucks fighting in her backyard. Two lines of tomato cages spaced four feet apart form the fences that block the entrance to her backyard. The outside fence has a piece of wood across the top to define the boundary for the deer. The deer don't want to jump into the small space in the middle of the two fences and prefer not to jump all the way across. She has also found that putting these same cage pieces around a tree has served as a great tree guard. A more attractive option is to make an existing fence higher. This standard picket fence has eight foot posts placed where the fencing sections meet. Heavy polypropylene mesh is reinforced with wire stretched across the top. The deer stay out and the mesh disappears from view. This can also be used above stone walls. You can raise the height of a plastic mesh fence by adding lines of 30 weight fishing line. The additional lines of filament raised this four foot mesh fence to eight feet. The homeowner added white and metallic strips of cloth to alert the deer to the new height. This vegetable garden fence effectively kept the deer out and they had a good harvest. Fishing line can make a great visually discreet fence and provide short-term protection for garden beds experiencing low or moderate deer pressure. One fence uses 30 pound fishing weight that is strung around a garden bed 30 to 36 inches above the ground placed two feet beyond the edge of the bed. When a deer feels the unseen filament pressing against its body, it gets anxious and wants to move away. Another option is to string multiple parallel strands of fishing line or paracord around the perimeter of the area you wish to protect or crisscross them through that area. Some have had success in using paracord around the perimeter of the yard. You can also run fishing line or paracard throughout your bed using plants or trees or garden stakes as support. And consider weaving fishing line around your most vulnerable plants. The University of Maryland Extension Home and Garden Center has done some very interesting work with creative fences and have some YouTube videos that are listed on your resource sheet that you might want to look at. They could inspire some ideas for how you might have some interesting fencing in your own yards. If your garden area that you want to protect is smaller than 8 to 16 feet, you can use a 50-inch high fence to exclude deer. Micro enclosures are small fenced areas that work because deer don't like to jump into a small space. The small space restricts their quick entry and exit. These fences are particularly good for vegetable gardens. We all want to save our veggies from the deer and know that vegetable gardens require sturdy fencing to exclude deer. I want to show you some designs that have worked effectively some, for some local homeowners. The first one here is using chicken wire and piping to securely keep their tomato plants intact. One face or side of this cage is able to be lifted off so that the gardener can harvest his tomatoes. You can have variable heights for your gardens as well. The lower structure here has tops that can be easily moved for access, yet keeping the deer and other critters out. Garden enclosures can be very interesting additions to your landscape. This garden structure is ready for spring planting. It shows that you can have an attractive enclosure that is architecturally pleasing in your front yard and grow a hearty harvest. You will note that many deer resistant plants surround it, fragrant herbs such as thyme and rosemary are another deterrent to keep the deer moving on. Well, no matter what fencing you choose to use, be sure to have sturdy materials and that it is properly anchored. Deer are clever enough to spot any gaps in the barrier designed to keep them out. So in addition to ensuring the adequate height of your fence, 
you'll want to make sure there are no breaks in the fence and no gaps at the bottom. All it takes is one little opening and they can squeeze through and all your fencing effort and expense has gone to waste. They are tenacious and will try to push their way through as they did with this small fence enclosure surrounding raspberry bushes. And be sure to set up any deterrence before deer establish their feeding patterns. Deer can become very persistent once they've discovered the delicious plants in your yard, making excluding deer very difficult. Are there any questions? There were a couple on fencing. Do you know anything about laser perimeter guards and their use with deer? I don't, but yeah. let me check into that. I'll see what I can provide okay. All on right. the addendum. A question also about electric fences. Do you know how strong the charge is and is it dangerous to humans and pets? I know that it is enough of a shock that the deer are very aware of it. I don't think it is dangerous for pets and children if it's uh, not something that injures the deer. But that is something else I will look into. I think a big thing on that is making sure that you are allowed to do it within your community, that you need to check with zoning. Okay. This one kind of made me giggle. Do you know how predator urine is collected? I don't. <laughs> I've often wondered about that. <laughs> I know. The mental image is... Uh... That might be something to research for the addendum. <laughs> okay, okay. And another listener commented that they've used milorganite, which is a nitrogen-releasing fertilizer around their hostas, and it's kept deer away. Does that make sense to you? I have heard about that. There have been mixed studies with that, but I do know that there's some people that actually put it in to little tea bag packets and to put it around their plants. Hmm. And I have heard that too. I personally have tried it and I didn't find it very effective, but okay. other people have sworn by it. Now we're going to move on to thinking about landscaping and how to make smart landscaping choices. Knowledge of deer behavior, learning how to divert their attention away from your plants and making it more difficult to get into your garden will help you create a space that is less inviting so that deer will pass you by. Now, if you want deer to come to your yard, do these things. Have lush plantings of well-watered fertilized plants. Use their favorite flowers and shrubs and be sure that they can easily be seen. Plant in an open area with nearby cover to deer, this landscape will have neon lights flashing, eat here. Now let's think about some ways that we can change our landscapes to discourage deer. First, consider your hardscape. A carefully planned garden can be quickly changed by a nighttime visit of a hungry deer browsing one shrub in a hedge or ruining a focus point. Include an edible aspects to your design. Consider focal points such as stone walls or water features that might be interesting in your landscape, but can't be eaten by the deer. These structural pieces are important because they provide stability and order to the garden and can draw the eye away from any deer damage that might occur. Create seating areas as a focal point. Bird baths and gazing balls are also lovely and edible additions to the garden. Any nearby deer nibbling is not as noticeable with these attractive visual distractions. Containers can be a great asset to a garden with deer visitors. Place them near the house, on your front porch, deck, or patio near human activity. Locating them near paths or busy areas may make them less likely to be eaten, but there's no guarantee. Even if deer devour the flowers in the arrangement, the plants can be replaced. You might want to consider using repellents with your ornamental plantings. This is also a place to grow veggies in containers. Vary your garden terrain. Deer don't like changing levels, particularly when they're on the run. 
They are comfortable walking up and down sloping ground, but are very uncomfortable jumping from level to level. Change the area by creating berms or sunken levels to make your yard more difficult for deer to manage. Focus on the entry points of your garden. Think of ways to discourage deer from coming in. Berms are particularly helpful at entry points. You can plant different flowers, shrubs on berms to provide extra height to hide the garden beyond. Deer won't want to enter if they can't see what's in the garden. Construct terraces on steep slopes in the garden to discourage the deer from those areas. Stairs are another great design deterrent as they dislike climbing steps. Create horizontal barriers at entry points. Deer don't like to walk over unstable rocky surfaces. Rocky areas with varied shaped rocks are not at all inviting. Some people have had success with creating six to eight foot borders of large rocks to prevent deer from entering their gardens. Now you can create horizontal barriers similar to the cattle guards that separate fenced pastures by using cinder blocks and wire. What you do is you position the cinder blocks on the ground and place wire across them. You can provide a protective square or rectangular area around a planting or a tree or an entrance. And what you do is you place the chicken wire on top. And when the deer step on it, they don't like the uneven footing as they sink when they walk across it. And if you put the larger wire on top, their feet don't quite go through it. So once again, it's very uncomfortable for them. Some folks who have larger properties like to put stacked wooden pallets at the edge of their garden areas to prevent deer from entering. You can hide the view using fences and shrubs together. You plant shrubs on the inside of a fence so deer can't see the landing area and then line the bottom with wire mesh to keep the deer from going over the fence. Remember, if they can't see in, they won't know what yummy plants are there. And additionally, they won't know if it's a safe place to forage, how large it is, and what their escape options are. You can create a living fence with hedges of deer-resistant plants to obscure the view of the garden and make access more difficult, and send the deer away from your garden to another place to browse. You can use evergreens that are not favored by deer, firs, Bruces, pines, hemlocks, and juniper can create an effective mixed variety head. Try to use native species if you can and avoid invasive woods such as bamboo or Japanese bayberry. And you can also mix evergreens and deciduous plants together. There are advantages to using mixed hedges. If you have a hedge with the same variety, one heavily damaged plant enjoyed by a deer would be very obvious. However, if you have a variety of foliage and shrub forms, it can help disguise any damage that might happen. And it may also help the plants to deal with disease better. Think native species to benefit wildlife in your choices. A strategically placed hedge can hide entry points to the garden, forcing deer to go around rather than directly entering it. It can also steer them away from approaching your border plantings. You may let them go to one area of the yard away from the places that you want them to be. Thorny species can be especially effective for this. Some folks that have larger properties, you can direct the deer to a place perhaps that you wanna to donate to them with foods you don't mind them eating. Now, you can create planting areas or zones around your house and plant more desirable plants near the house. These areas of heavy human traffic might help discourage the browsing. This is where you might want to grow plants that deer are most likely to damage. And I would encourage you then to either use fencing or to, to enclose it or repellents to provide additional barriers if needed. In the middle zone, you can use plants that are moderately deer resistant. In the furthest zone, Plant the most deer-resistant plants. This is an area where you might do very little to reduce browsing. 
alternately, you could have plants you know the deer like, but you don't mind them eating, hoping that they'll stay there and ignore the rest of your garden. You might want to plant the perimeter of your yard with strongly scented herbs and flowers that will deter the deer. Deer don't like to be near strong scents. Highly scented plants make it difficult for them to recognize the scent of nearby predators. Throughout the garden, aim to have a diverse range of species, including natives. Now, you can consider deer when you're laying out your garden. Think layers. Good garden design incorporates low, medium, and high layers of plants. This can be an advantage in a garden visited by deer. Deer browsing may exaggerate the layers, but the basic design stays in place. With layers, any browsing may not even be noticed. A limited color scheme helps maintain the visual sense of order in any undesired munching. Try planting a single variety of plants in large drifts. The thinking is that if a deer browses in that area, not all of the plants in a large grouping will be nibbled, any damage will be less obvious, and the plants will better be able to recover. Try interspersing deer-resistant plants throughout the garden. This may discourage deer from exploring further. Try to include natives in your plan to support wildlife. Use companion plants. These are plants that are very deer resistant. You can use them to provide a protective ring around your preferred plants. You can put deer resistant plants at the front of the border with more vulnerable plants to the interior. You can grow highly scented plants such as herbs and flowers together. Herbs are a terrific companion plant. Thyme, mint, and oregano work very well as ground covers in the garden. You can use ferns or grasses with other plants. They can be very effective in protecting your special plants. One gardener successfully grew a mass of hostas with allium scattered within the planting. And if you've ever tried to grow hosta in deer country, you know that's quite a feat. There are some really lovely plants that are great plant protectors, including mountain mint, little blue stem, lady fern, bee balm, and lavender that you might want to consider in your garden. Deer usually travel the same paths during their neighborhood visits. Some designers suggest that you disguise the damage with small, strong ground covers like Corsican mint or elfin thyme. You also may find it helpful to spray deterrent to discourage the deer from using them. It is important to keep your garden neat and tidy if you wanna keep deer out. Keep underbrush to a minimum so you don't provide a place for deer to hide. Deer are attracted to secluded areas with leaves, pine needles, or ferns that provide a comfy spot for them to rest and ruminate before they come back to your yard for another run at the buffet. This is particularly important if you live near a wooded edge or have a woodland landscape. Try to remove food sources that might be in your yard, rake up the acorns or any fallen fruit and raise bird feeders six feet above. Plant more drought friendly plants as they resist browsing much more so. The coarse cell wall makes them difficult to digest. Yarrow and false blue indigo and lavenders are good choices for that. Avoid overwatering. Water deeply to encourage rooting and strong, sturdy, less palatable plants. Use a soaker hose close to the ground to avoid wetting the leaves. Wet foliage does attract thirsty deer, and this is particularly a problem during droughts. Avoid over-fertilizing your plants. What happens is high nutrogen fertilizers encourage soft growth, which attracts deer. Use organic matter to enhance the soil and improve soil structure and drainage. And if you must use fertilizer to support your heavy feeders, use a slow release balanced formula.
and do limb up your fruit trees. They are such a delight for deer and they will go after that wonderful fruit. Are there any questions? You had talked about being proactive before deer have established eating patterns and pathways, but someone mentioned that the deer are already eating their hostas, and is it too late to use repellents? I don't think it's too late at all. Go ahead and try that. I am doing that too. And the other thing that I'm doing is putting the filament around them. I've got little stakes surrounding those plants, and then I've strung filament across and crisscrossing it too, around the border and then crisscrossing that area. So far, they have not come back for any, and I don't know whether they just haven't been in the yard or if what I've done has scared them off. Then there were two comments. Someone mentioned they use dog poop. And another mentioned they use a preparation called deer scram for discouraging deer. Do you have any comments about those? I haven't heard about using the dog product there, but <laughs> it certainly sounds like a good idea. The only problem with that is though that you're providing food for the rats and mice. Deer scram is one that I have heard about and I have personally used. I use two different products and they alternate. One smells like holiday baking when I spray it on. The other one is a lot like a wet dog for about a couple hours and then it goes away. <laughs> so what's for dinner? How do deer decide what to eat? Well, it all depends. Deer feed on over 700 species of plants, but they do show preferences for certain plants. They like a variety of taste experiences just like people. During their first garden visit in the spring, they take a tasting bite of everything. They happily pick around plants to find their favorites. Whether deer will target a particular plant depends upon their previous experiences, their nutritional needs, palatability, weather, and the season. The degree of deer pressure makes a big difference. More deer means more deer damage. Also, the availability of other food sources in the herd range impacts how often and what they eat in your garden. But just remember, a hungry deer will eat anything. Before we consider what to plant, let's talk about plants to avoid. Deer candy are plants that deer love. They are a beacon to your garden. I don't know how they know when I put deer candy in, but boy, do they come right away. Avoid uh, plants with these characteristics if you can. Soft leaves, stems, and flowers like hosta. Plants that have narrow leaves that are not stiff like arborvitae. And plants that have broadleaf leaves or flowers such as daylily. Other ones to consider to exclude from your garden are plants that have smooth leaves that are not fuzzy or prickly like you, sweet tasting leaves and flowers like impatience and a sweet soft fragrance such as roses. I've been surprised at the nibbling on the roses that I have. You wouldn't think, but they even go after the thorny parts. Unfortunately, there are no deer-proof plants. It's just wishful thinking. No plant is safe under all conditions. Rather, you can think of deer-resistant plants as plants that deer are less likely to eat. They may nibble them, but most of the time they don't destroy them. Seasonal needs impact what plants deer target. Know too that deer have their own preferences. Each herd likes certain plants and they learn from each other about those plants. The plants that are being eaten a mile or two away from you may be ignored by the herd in your neighborhood. So talk to your neighbors to see what nibbling is going on in their yards. Use local plant guides to help you make wise choices for your yard and be smart with your selections. If deer continually eat a plant, even if it's listed as highly deer resistant, don't use it. Also, oops, sorry, look for plants that deer are less likely to browse. Now we'll move on and look at some plant characteristics that make them less likely for a deer to go after them. 
strongly scented flowers and foliage interfere with deer's sense of smell, confusing them. They need to be aware of the presence of a predator and don't want to fear be near these plants with the strong aromas. Bearded iris and rosemary and boxwood are all good options. Herbs such as rosemary, mint, sage, and lavender are great choices, along with onions and chives and garlic. Other scented plants they tend to ignore are cat mint, sweet alyssum, lantana, bee balm, resin sage, mountain mint, spice bush, and calamint. Deer learn to avoid certain plants from their mothers or their own bad experiences. Some of these bitter tasting plants contain alkaloids that are poisonous to deer. They include daffodils, bleeding hearts, and Christmas fern. False indigo, poppies, and snowdrops are not tolerated, and most ferns also fit this category as well as yarrow. You can add oriental poppy and euphorbia to this list too. Deer don't like sharp edges on the plants they eat because it causes irritation. They're difficult to digest. These native grasses and sedges are usually ignored by deer. Muley grass and bloom sedge are attractive structural additions to the garden, and some people will surround uh, preferred plants with these grasses. Seersucker sedge and Pennsylvania sedge are excellent choices for ground covers. And another thing also with grasses, some folks have found it useful to put them at the entry into the yard. The deer just don't want to mess with them. Unless a deer is starving, plants with thick fibrous foliage are usually avoided. These are very hard for them to digest, and plants in this category include peony, hellebores, and Adam's needle. Other plants to consider iris, leatherleaf, and arrowhead viburnum. Deer are not attracted to gray-colored plants. Gray plants such as lungwort, dusty miller, and Russian sage are usually ignored. Deer steer clear of plants that have pungent aromatic oils in their leaves, including basil, lemon balm, and sage. Spiny, bristly leaves or stems are not preferred. Deer dislike plants with these features. Consider beer breeches, globe thistle, or sea holly. Deer dislike fuzzy or hairy textured foliage. The hairs irritate their tongue. If you're wondering if a plant will be desired by the deer, you can put it against your wrist. And then if you feel soft or fuzzy hairs when you rub it, you can count on them not liking that plant. Lamb's ear, Brunera, and yarrow are such plants, along with ladies' mantle, flower and tobacco, and azuratum. There are several good lists of deer-resistant plants to help you determine which plants will be more likely to survive in deer country. Deer-resistant lists often vary from each other and maybe from your own experience. Keep in mind that deer tastes do vary by herd, by season, by availability of more appetizing plants or the lack of options. Be sure to use these references from your local area as much as you can, as there may be regional differences in deer preferred plants. These references are more likely to fit the patterns of deer eating near you. And try to select plants from the rarely damaged and seldom severely damaged categories. Several sources of deer resistant plants are listed in the resource pages accompanying this presentation. Now, one reliable source is Rutgers, landscape plants rated by deer resistant site. The plants here can be searched by common or Latin name, rating, or plant type. It's a great tool, but do be aware that not all native plants are represented, and they do include invasives. So you might find that deer won't browse your bamboo plant rated as rarely damaged, but you might have a major new gardening problem to handle. But several sources, as I said, are in the resources page accompanying this on the MGNV site. There are a lot of native plant possibilities to use that are deer resistant. Sometimes I hear people say, ah, native plants, they're gonna get eaten but that's not true. In your handout, you'll find lists of specific native resistant plants that you might find useful to add to your garden. 
let's take a closer look at a few plants that work well in gardens with deer visitors. There is a specific sheet in your resources with links to the tried and true sheets on the MGNV website to accompany all these plants that I'm talking about. First, let's look at trees. River birch is a multi-trunk tree that quickly reaches 50 to 70 feet. These trees are noted for their beautiful exfoliating bark. It's an important food source for many species of moths, butterflies, and songbirds. Another deer resistant tree is the American holly. It's a slow growing pyramid shaped evergreen that reaches 15 to 40 feet. It is known for its beautiful, brilliant red berries like droops that present from October through the winter. Birds enjoy the fruit and cover and nesting support of this tree. Red maples grow 40 to 80 feet tall and this deciduous shade tree has a rounded crown and is known for the red, orange and beautiful yellow foliage. Red flowers appear in March and April and it is also another important source for wildlife food and shelter. Mountain laurel is one of the few evergreen shrubs that deer tend to ignore. It has dark green leathery leaves and in the spring has unusual large white to pale pink flowers. Inkberry is a native evergreen holly that is one of the best natives to grow in informal hedges. It's small black fruit are enjoyed by songbirds. An arrowwood viburnum has lovely red fall foliage and bluish berries and white flowers in the spring. Now let's look at some forbs. Black-eyed Susan is a clump forming biennial. The daisy-like flowers bloom from June to October. The plant attracts pollinators and butterflies and serves as a larval host and just seems to dance with the goldfinches and other birds in the summer. Wild blue indigo is a lovely plant that grows as an upright bushy clump. This beautiful plant has gray green foliage with erect terminal racemes in May and June, and then has these gorgeous little black, blue black seed pods. Rough stem goldenrod brightens gardens from August to November. Fireworks cultivar is a bit more compact and contained and flowers more abundantly than the straight species. Well, let's go on and look at some ground covers you might want to have. Green and gold is a matte forming ground cover and the dainty little yellow flowers bloom from March to June and then sporadically throughout the summer. It works well as a path edging or ground cover in rain and woodland gardens. White wood aster blooms late summer to early fall with clusters of white flowers. It's a good choice for woodland gardens as it handles dry shade. Butterflies and birds benefit from this plant. Golden ragwort is a plump forming perennial. Small daisy-like flowers bloom in clusters on top of the stems in April followed by seeded fruits and white bristles. Butterflies and bees love it and it's a larval moth host. All right, so we've gone through an awful lot today. You've learned about all kinds of things that might help you deter the deer. Living with deer requires you using your knowledge of deer and their seasonal needs. So what's next? Well, use this knowledge of deer to help guide you. Be plant savvy here. Try to use highly deer resistant plants Check local deer resistant plant lists for best information and consider using companion plants in your beds and being creative with your landscaping. Be an observer, noting the size and health of the deer to help you anticipate any deer pressure that's likely to come up. For example, if you experience drought conditions, there are likely to be fewer acorns in the fall to fatten up the deer. This is a clue that you will probably need to provide more protection during the winter. Know your neighborhood deer and where they go. Are they visiting your neighbors or staying on your property to eat and sleep? Talk with your neighbors to find out what they're eating in their yards. Be persistent with the strategies you use and remember to combine techniques. With time, 
you may be able to steer the deer who visit your property to other locations. Try to be flexible with your expectations and how you approach deer damage. A 50% reduction in browse is a big success. And remember, what worked last year may not work this year. Before we close, I want to leave you with a few thoughts that have guided me in dealing with my own garden. It's important to be open with the browsing you can live with. What at first might seem a big disappointment may turn out to be an unexpected delight. Even though deer usually ignored my black-eyed Susans, one culprit gave my mass planting the Chelsea chop last spring. All of the tops of the plants were gone, and I was furious with myself for not spraying them sooner. However, the early season pruning, which is really a very good gardening technique, turned out to be a happy accident as the flowers bloomed a bit later, but gave me a lovely display that extended past their normal bloom time in October. Gardening is a dance with nature and we're all creatures in the garden. I hope that you're able to develop a positive mindset so that you can make gardening with deer a more joyful experience. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you found a few ideas that may help you with your own gardening dilemmas. Are there any more questions? Yes, one last question. Someone says their neighbor throws out scraps to feed the deer because they're starving. Uh, she wants to know if you have any advice. Ooh, that is a tough one because there are a lot of problems with feeding the deer. One is that they become very dependent on coming there. Deer are then congregating. And when they congregate like that, it is not good because when you have a grouping, there's a better chance of disease being spread. I know that it's highly advised that people not do that. She might want to get advice um, from possibly Animal Welfare League. Mm -hmm. um, I will also do some looking to see if I can provide you with some resources in the addendum that would give you additional information to share. I think a lot of people think that feeding the deer is a good thing, but we don't want them to become dependent on the foods that we provide them. We really want them to be able to find foods in the parks, which I know is difficult in some areas, and to be able to do it on their own. The kudos are pouring in. This was an absolutely wonderful, comprehensive review of deer biology, barriers, and good plants for deer. I just learned so much, and I'm sure everyone else did. I encourage you to look at the resources in the one list. It has a lot of information that I thought might be useful to you. There's some articles on how to create some fencing. They're the videos I told you about. There also are articles about deer behavior, some techniques to use that might be helpful in your toolbox for dealing with deer. They're beautiful and they're wonderful. They're fun to watch, but we just don't want them nibbling our yards. <laughs> All right. That about sums it up, I think. Thank you very much, Kathy. Bye-bye. Thank you all for attending.